Prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and thromboxane are collectively known as econocytes, and that's because they originate from polyunsaturated fatty acids that contain 20 carbon atoms. In fact, the prefix econosa means 20 atoms. Now, these molecules are produced by essentially all the different types of tissues in our body in very small quantities, and they act as important local mediated molecules. Now, econocytes are not hormones. So remember, hormones are produced in glands. They are stored in glands for long periods of time, and when released, they travel very far distances to carry out their physiologic effect. In contrast, econocytes don't do that. They're local mediated molecules. They're synthesized by individual cells. They're used very quickly and then destroyed quickly by those cells and they act locally around the cell that actually synthesizes it. They don't travel very far distances. So, prostaglandins, thromboxane, and leukotrienes are all synthesized from the same exact 20 carbon fatty acid known as arachidonic acid. So, we ingest food, and food contains the precursor molecule known as linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is a six carbon fatty acid that the cells use to ultimately synthesize arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid is attached onto phospholipids in the cell membrane where it's stored. So, normally, arachidonic acid is stored in the cell membrane by attaching it to phospholipids. So before we actually can use arachidonic acid to synthesize these econocytes, we have to detach it from the phospholipids in a cell membrane. And the enzyme that does that is phospholipase A2, where A2 stands for arachidonic acid. So we activate phospholipase A2, and it cleaves the arachidonic acid from the phospholipids in a cell membrane, freeing it. And now we have free arachidonic acid in the cytoplasm. Now, arachidonic acid can take one of two pathways. We can either take the cyclooxygenase pathway, the COX pathway, which will synthesize prostaglandins and thromboxane, or we can take this other pathway, lipooxygenase pathway, that will synthesize leukotrienes. The pathway that it takes depends on the cell that we're in and the tissue that we're in, and also depends on the pre-existing conditions. And we'll talk about what this is in just a moment. So first, let's talk about the cyclooxygenase pathway. The cyclooxygenase pathway involves an enzyme known as cyclooxygenase COX. And it utilizes two diatomic oxygens to convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandin G2, PGG2. Now, we actually have two different cyclooxygenase enzymes. We have two different isozymes. We have COX-1 and, uh, and uh, COX-2. COX-1 is found essentially in all the different tissues in our body, and it's especially important in places like the GI tract, the renal tissue, and the platelets. So cyclooxygenase is always on. It's continually converting arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. And once we form the prostaglandin G2, we can have peroxidases in the cells to basically synthesize these four different types of molecules. So we have prostaglandin I2, prostaglandin E2, prostaglandin F2 alpha, and then thromboxane A2. And depending on the conditions and the cell that we're in, we can synthesize specific types of molecules and not others. And so usually when COX-1 is on, we synthesize these two. And so prostaglandin I2, also known as prostacyclin, and prostaglandin E2. Prostaglandin I2 is produced predominantly within the endothelium. And it causes smooth muscle relaxation, it causes vasodilation, so it brings more blood, and it also prevents formation of platelets and prevents activation of platelets. And then we have prostaglandin E2. Prostaglandin E2 is found in most tissues of the body. It also causes smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation. So these two are very important in the GI tract and the kidneys because they allow blood flow to reach these organs and that maintains the GI tract and the kidneys. So you can imagine if we use medications such as NSAIDs, so either aspirin or things like endomethacin or naproxen, all of these will block COX-1. 
And by blocking COX-1, we decrease the production of these vasodilators, and that can cause ischemia in the GI tract, causing ulcers to form. It can cause ischemia in the kidneys, causing kidney damage. And so that's why NSAIDs can damage the GI tract and cause ulcers to form and cause kidney injury and kidney damage. What about this other cyclooxygenase, COX-2? COX-2 is not found everywhere, but it's found in specific places like inflammatory cells and vascular endothelia. And it's not always on, but it's, uh, but it's inducible. So we can turn it on under certain conditions. What types of conditions? Well, if we have an inflammatory process, infection, if we have damage in the blood vessel, that will activate the COX-2 in inflammatory cells and vascular endothelium. And so, what, uh, and so things like cytokines and the toxin, growth factors, tumor factors, all of this can induce the activity of COX-2 under these conditions and cause formation of prostaglandin G2. And this will form mostly these two, so thromboxane A2 and PGF2 alpha. So for example, let's suppose we damage a blood vessel. And now what we want to do is we want to cause local vasoconstriction and activation of platelets to help create a blood clot. And so we form predominantly these. Thromboxane A2 is formed predominantly by activated platelets and it causes increase in platelet aggregation and platelet activation. It causes smooth muscle vasoconstriction, uh, smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. In addition, we have the PG, uh, PGF2 alpha, which is produced by many tissues of the body, and it does the same thing as this. It basically causes smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. So these two vasodilate, but these two vasoconstrict. And so under normal healthy conditions, we have a predominance of these two, and that help maintain a nice vasodilated tone to help bring blood flow to that organ. But under conditions of infection or blood clot or whatnot, uh, not blood clot, uh, damage to the blood vessel, that can activate these, and so that can, uh, that can cause vasoconstriction and um, activation of platelets. And so ultimately we see that this pathway is responsible for maintaining gastric and renal integrity, for maintaining platelet and clot homeostasis, regulating smooth muscle tone and blood flow. So that helps maintain blood flow to the brain, for example, maintaining brain function, helps maintain blood flow to the bone, helping maintain bone homeostasis and so forth. And this is mediated by COX-1. And then when COX-2 is induced under certain conditions, that can mediate inflammation and fever and blood clot formation. And again, NSAIDs will block not only COX-1, but COX-2. So when we take NSAIDs such as aspirin and endomethacin in, uh, with the goal of blocking COX-2, that can help prevent the inflammatory response, such as fever and pain and edema and so forth but we also block COX-2. And so that can cause these side effects that can cause ulcers to form and kidneys to actually become damaged and so forth. And so we can use medications that selectively block COX-2 and this is Selexicob, uh, Selecoxib. Selecoxib is a selective COX-2 inhibitor that prevents the inflammatory response mediated by these mediators, but allows this enzyme to actually continue functioning. And then we can also use corticosteroids. So corticosteroids block not only COX-2, but they also actually block phospholipase A2, and that prevents this entire pathway from happening, and, and so that prevents the inflammation. But by blocking this, we also prevent this pathway, and that can actually cause side effects as well. And then we have this other pathway in which we form leukotrienes. Now, this pathway takes place predominantly in places like white blood cells and mast cells and platelets and heart vasculature and lung vasculature. And this pathway is responsible for allergic reactions, allergic responses, and inflammation. So, for example, asthma patients, when they have an asthma exacerbation, will activate this pathway. And so we have a bunch of medications that we can use to block a variety of places along the pathway. So, Arachidonic acid converts to leukotriene. So, for example, let's suppose we have an asthma patient that um, um, 
uh, undergoes an asthma exacerbation because of some type of stimulus and so we activate this pathway in leuk uh, in neutrophils and other mass uh, and, and mast cells and so forth and so arachidonic acid is converted to 5 hp by the activity of 5 lipooxygenase that then is converted into leukotriene A2 and this acts as a base for these other leukotrienes. From leukotriene A2 we form leukotriene B2. What, uh, what leukotriene B2 does is it increases the ability of leukocyte to actually adhere to endothelium of blood vessels. It increases chemotaxis of neutrophils and it also does some other things. It, for example, stimulates the enzymes to be released from the lysosomes, in, uh, from the lysosomes inside the cells. And then we and we can also form leukotriene C2, D2, and E2. And all of these induce smooth muscle contraction. They cause constriction of the blood vessels and bronchoconstriction. And they also increase the permeability of capillaries. So that can cause leakage of fluid into the interstitial space. And so that can cause the typical signs and symptoms found in patients with asthma and other allergic reactions. So the lipooxygenase pathway, when activated, cause production of leukotrienes, which mediate allergic response and inflammation.